So hi, everyone. Um, so huge thanks to um, Alexander, Tang Yu, and um, Sammy for organizing this incredible workshop. And um, excited to be here. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I know I'm between you and lunch, so I'll try and keep things uh, on time. Um, so today, I'm really excited to talk a bit about transfer learning in the context of deep learning. So transfer learning is this incredibly popular technique. It's used almost everywhere that we apply deep neural networks. Uh, but there's also this challenge that we really don't understand many aspects of it all that, all that well. And so by the end of this talk, I hope that you, know, you have some sense of all the many different ways it comes up, and also some of the interesting open questions there are in, in the field. So um, a lot of this talk is going to be based off of um, a paper, Understanding Transfer Learning for Medical Imaging, uh, that's joint work with my collaborators, Chi Wan Zhang, John Kleinberg, and Sammy Benjo. OK, so let's dive right in. What is transfer learning? Very basic. So in the settings that we're, we're going to really be studying, what you do is you first you learn a classifier on some task. Let's call it task A. And sometimes we call this pre-training. Then, having learned task A, you continue training this classifier on a new task, task B. And the goal is really to get good performance on task B. So the goal is to get good performance on task B. You might ask, why train on task A at all? And the, the general belief in the community is that if you know, task A is sort of complex and diverse and very general, then by going through this process of training on task A, hopefully you've learned useful things that you can sort of transfer over when you start retraining on, on task B. So this high level framework um, actually has um, connections to a lot of interesting work that's come out from the, the, the theoretical perspective. Um, I think uh, Zach mentioned some in his talk earlier today. And I wanted to kind of give a quick point out to Shai Ben David, who is maybe here. No, I don't see him. Oh, you're here. You're here. OK, <laughs> in the front, um, where um, there's been a lot of interesting work done in, in this very related field of domain adaptation to try and understand this from a more formal framework. And I think the time's really come to revisit some of these ideas and see how we can use them to give us better insights for, for transfer learning in, in the deep learning context. So speaking of transfer learning and deep learning, what does that look like? Well, it's very similar. I'm sorry, very simple. You sort of just replace classifier with deep network. So you have this deep network. It's going to be your classifier. You randomly initialize it, and you train on task A. And this will be known as pre-training. Then you take this network, and, and it's sort of converged to some set of parameters on task A. And then you train it again, this time on task B. And then voila, you have your final model that you're going to deploy. And it's, it's hopefully going to do great on, on task B. So um, this paradigm is pretty simple, but it's been extremely successful. And it's probably the computer vision community that sort of really showed us um, how successful this could be in various applications. Um, so in sort of specifically the current setting, what people do is pre-train a, a large convolutional neural network on some data set of large images. Um, and you know, ImageNet gets a special shout out here. It's extremely popular for, for pre-training, so much so that there are sort of entire papers saying why ImageNet is good for transfer learning. Um, but besides that, there are a couple of other data sets. So MS Coco is a very popular big computer vision benchmark for object detection. That's sometimes used for pre-training. And companies also tend to have their own internal data sets, which they like using for pre-training. So um, a really big one that Google likes using is JFT, which has sort of 300 million images, so absolutely enormous. What's been really interesting to see in the past couple of years, though, is that transfer learning has also become very popular in applications in natural language processing. Um, so in the past, people were able to transfer word embedding. So you've probably seen these diagrams of taking a word in your vocabulary, getting a vector representation, and then these vector representations have all of these nice properties. We could do that for a while. Um, but it's only more recently that sort of all of these neural networks that are named after Muppets for some reason um, have, have kind of uh, been developed. And that lets us transfer much more complex representations of language. And that's shown to be very, very successful in a lot of uh, standard uh, natural language tasks. And now I have to mention the most important part of transfer learning, which is GitHub for transfer learning. So Ben mentioned uh, in a talk um, in his talk earlier that um, you know GitHub can be this very useful uh, research resource, and um, that's uh, definitely very true in transfer learning. 
So in transfer learning kind of applications, nobody actually bothers with the pre-training step. Instead, you go to GitHub and you sort of find the model you're interested in and find all of its pre-trained weights, and then you just download it. And then after you download it, you just perform the fine tuning for whatever task you're interested in. And, and this is really important because what this has enabled is it's enabled people who totally aren't working on sort of core machine learning to apply transfer learning to all of their problems. And nowhere is this more true than in medical imaging, where, where it's sort of the entire community has almost universally adopted transfer learning as, as this paradigm. And what's the setup here? Um, well, the setup here is that you take this sort of standard pre-trained ImageNet model, something large and complex like Inception v3, and, uh, then you tr and then you have sort of these pre-trained weights on ImageNet that you sort of downloaded from somewhere. So ImageNet has, you know, amongst other things, a whole bunch of different dog breeds. And then bizarrely, you sort of fine tune this model to do all kinds of medical predictions. So you fine tune it to predict diseases on chest x-rays, diseases like retinal diseases, um, PET scans for early detection of Alzheimer's, and sort of the most exotic application was even sort of screening human embryos for IVF treatments. So people are just sort of going out there and doing this. And, and when you think about this, this is kind of bizarre because the reason the community um, you know, wanted to do transfer learning is this belief that you sort of learn features on sort of this, this uh, source data set, and then you can kind of transfer all of this to, to your, your target task. But of course, medical images and natural images are extremely different to each other. So it's kind of interesting to understand what's, what's going on here. Um, one final thing is these aren't just sort of um, sort of turning into papers where you see accuracies, but um, they're actually being deployed in clinic. So this is the example of one company called IDX, which literally states that it takes Inception v3 pre-trained on ImageNet and is using these to diagnose retinal diseases, and it's sort of out in clinic right now. So, oh. is there any understanding of what adversarial examples of the Inception model mean for this problem? Adversarial examples where for medical images, you mean? I, I'm just asking, you're saying this is being deployed and it's natural to think about adversarial examples for the inception model. Um, not that, I mean, so... so we won't talk about transferability of adversarial examples today, yeah. uh, No, I'm not talking about transferability. Um, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question, sort of like how much can you like kind of do, do like these are completely different data sets, so I think that's also like a, a very interesting thing to, to look at. Um, but okay, so while we're kind of going ahead and sort of deploying all of these, there's kind of this real challenge because even in the natural image setting, we actually don't uh, understand the effects of transfer learning that well. So I'm going to review some results um, which have just come out in literally the last year that have really challenged the common assumptions people have on transfer learning. So this is a picture of MS Coco, and I mentioned it earlier. It's a very popular computer vision benchmark for, for doing um, object detection. So this is kind of what it looks like. You're trying to learn these bounding boxes. And in almost all of the competition entries, the standard thing to do is you pre-train on ImageNet, and then you sort of fine tune your ImageNet model on this, this MS Coco task. But then last year, we got this paper, Rethinking ImageNet Pre-Training, which basically showed just by kind of being a, maybe a little bit more careful about how you pick your learning rate, um, you actually get exactly the same results from random initialization as you do with, with pre-training. Now, part of the reason people really like pre-training on ImageNet is, again, this belief that it's kind of this big, diverse task. And sort of if you train on there, you're going to learn lots of interesting features that you can kind of reuse in lots of places. So sort of this underlying assumption is more data is, is great. But then there was, there was another paper, also just last year, uh, which looked at pre-training on JFT, which is sort of this even bigger data set, sort of 300 million images. And what they find is that more, more pre-training data is not always better, which is this sort of very closely held assumption in the community. So in particular, like they sort of try training from random initialization versus the entire data set. And in a bunch of places, the performances are actually really pretty comparable. Oh, yeah. I say more data is not better. What I wonder about is, are they fixing the number of training iterations or the number of epochs or some other um, downstream criteria? Like, if you fix the number of training iterations, mm -hmm. it would still be the case that uh, more training data, more source domain data is not better. I suspect that that won't be true. 
Right. Um, and the question is like, but it's, it's like fitting more to the training distribution is not necessarily better. To the source distribution is not necessarily better. Um, so they're they're not fixing the number of um, training iterations. I think I think they're literally just training to convergence and seeing what the performance looks like. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's the difference, though. Right. Like. So you're you're difference. saying maybe you just sort of like do sort of early stopping and then sort of um, see. Or you just fix it. Whatever the number is that you got from the first amount of examples, uh -huh. or whatever it is, do the apples to apples part. You do the same number of updates, uh -huh. um, but with more. More data. More, so yeah, more data points. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure it'll make a difference. I, I, I see your point, and I, I'd have to check to see exactly what they did. But I'm it, almost sure it'll make a difference. But okay. I'm willing to be wrong, and maybe after we, we, we'll, we can discuss this out, yeah. offline. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so one interesting point um, to, to kind of make here, and I think this is actually connected to some of the theoretical work in this uh, um, that's that's sort of come up in related topics, is if you do a better job of actually picking the subsets of data that um, you train on, you actually do see significant performance gains. Um, and I think, again, this is a place where we can kind of revisit some of the theoretical ideas and see if we can do something better. This, this process is like relatively ad hoc. Um, and then finally, one other paper that came out just earlier this year, do better image net models transfer better, um, has this kind of makes this implicitly makes this very uh, interesting observation that when you decide to do transfer learning, you're not just taking the, the features, um, but you're also committing to an architecture because you download them both together. And if your task looks very different to ImageNet, you know, this is something you should be, be aware of and thinking about. Um, and so do better image net models transfer better? Well, it's complicated. Um, there's this nuanced relationship that depends on sort of how you regularize during the training process, um, the data set, uh, the specifics of the data set and size, et cetera. Um, and so you sort of actually see a lot of variability based off of all of these conditions. And sometimes you actually get pretty similar performance as, as usual. What does optimal mean here? Um, optimal, wait, optimal where? Um, oh, here. Um, yeah, so this is optimal for transfer. So, so this is sort of like standard ways in which people can perform regularization. And this is how you tend to download your pre-trained models. Um, but these are actually sort of not as good for, for doing transfer learning on. And, and here, if you kind of train in a slightly different way, you actually end up with better um, features for transfer. So are you, do you know the regime under which they did the pre-training? Uh, pre like, you know, how many layers they froze for what architecture? And yeah, so th this paper is really thorough. So I highly recommend reading it. So they tried, they tried um, pretty much everything. So they tried um, this sort of like fixed feature extractor setting where you sort of freeze things and then just retrain some of the top. They also tried a fine tuning setting where you sort of train everything. And they were also, of course, comparing to training from, from scratch in these settings. Um, and so yeah, the, the kind of exact results vary a little bit. Um, I think for fine tuning, maybe you have like slightly less sensitivity to some of these these settings, particularly for larger target data sets. But um, yeah, they try everything, so definitely worth reading. Um, so this is all in the natural image setting. What about in the medical image um, setting? Actually, um, hardly anything is explored in the medical image setting, um, which I think is sort of something we should we could really try and address from sort of two angles. Um, firstly, of course, I think it's important to study it because we're actually deploying these in a lot of places, and it's important to understand what's going on, particularly as this is sort of a very counterintuitive thing to do. Um, secondly, I think this medical imaging setting also captures a very interesting um, part of, uh, uh, captures an interesting um, sort of regime in, of performing transfer learning. So here your source and your target tasks are extremely different to each other. Like the data is different, the actual task you're going for is different. Um, and as we'll see later, there are still some benefits that, um, that come up. So sort of understanding why that happens, I think is, is sort of very interesting to, to explore from a purely principled angle. Okay, so in this talk, um, so first we'll do a quick sort of performance evaluation of transfer just to sort of um, set things up. And um, then we're going to go into a little bit more detail and try and understand how is pre-training affecting the actual features we're learning in our model. Um, and for this, I'll also touch on some work we've been looking at on, on studying representational similarity of networks using canonical correlation analysis. And then finally, and um, very interestingly, and also somewhat paradoxical, we'll look at some feature independent properties of, of transfer that we see. OK, so the first oh, question. Oh. Is there like an agreed upon notion of what fine tuning means in these settings? Like, is it time limited? 
or is it limited by how much the weights move? Yeah, so I'm um, fine. Um, so I think the question is sort of, is there a precise definition of what fine tuning means in this setting? Is there, as in like, do you sort of stop after some amount of time or yeah, is there something very specified? Um, the answer is like not really. You're really just sort of training to convergence. You're pretty much, you're mostly stopping once you uh, see that like validation loss has converged. Um, yeah, but okay, so any more questions? No, okay. So, so let, let's let's take a let's breeze through the first part. Um, so first part, we're going to just try and evaluate um, the actual performance gains of transfer. Um, and to do this, um, the way people tend to evo um, evaluate transfer learning, because you're sort of downloading these data sets from uh, these sorry these models and these uh, weights from GitHub, is uh, you just tend to evaluate it on on standard ImageNet architectures. So like some big complicated thing like this. But as I mentioned, if your task looks really different to ImageNet, it's kind of important to think about the fact that you're making this implicit architectural choice. And so in our evaluation, we also evaluated this much smaller family of architectures that we call CBRs. Um, they're really just vanilla convolutional neural networks. They're called CBRs because the most sort of popular and successful um, way of having a vanilla convnet these days is to have a convolution followed by batch norm followed by ReLU activation. And these things are really tiny. They're maybe sort of like one eighth to maybe one twentieth the size of your full fledged ImageNet architecture. And then in terms of tasks, we looked at sort of two large scale um, medical imaging tasks. One of them is um, diagnosing different diseases from chest x rays, uh, and another one is diagnosing um, a certain kind of retinal disease, diabetic retinopathy, uh, from scans of the, the back of your eye. So we, we sort of ran these experiments across all of these different architectures, random initialization and transfer learning. It was a lot of experiments, um, but we saw some clear takeaways. So firstly, um, perhaps you know, sort of following on from some of the results we've seen in the natural image settings, transfer and random initialization actually perform pretty comparably. So here's a sort of complicated results table we got from our chest X-ray um, experiments. Um, and if we look at where transfer and random initialization perform um, comparably, it's actually for most of the table. And in some cases, transfer even, sorry, random initialization even outperforms transfer. Secondly, and, and interestingly, we observed that these simple vanilla um, conv networks actually performed about as well as these standard ImageNet architectures. So we weren't really trying to optimize for performance. We just wanted to try some simple things to see what they looked like compared to ImageNet, like ImageNet architectures, because those architectures are really pretty different to, to what you might want for the, for the medical data. And so. How did you train those? The simple architectures, did you also pre-train them on the same uh, on ImageNet? Yes, yes. So we pre-trained them on ImageNet, and then we and then fine-tuned uh, on the medical data sets. Yeah, and then sort of did those comparisons. Yeah. Uh, what's your approximate size of your data set when you train from random initialization? So, from, so the data set size, so we actually varied this, so like kind of uh, variations of this are in the paper. Um, the full data set is around 200K images, I think, which is kind of like reasonable size, but um, sort of smallish compared to uh, ImageNet, which is like in the millions. Um, so it's sort of interesting to see that these sort of perform comparably. And then um, finally, um, we also saw that ImageNet performance was not actually indicative of how these architectures would perform on the medical task. So what do I mean? So let's look at another results table. So here's ResNet 50, and here are these two architectures, and here's what we saw when we trained them on ImageNet. Um, these architectures actually perform horribly. They're not designed for ImageNet in a way that I can sort of explain offline. Um, but when we look at how they do on the medical task, they're actually really within sort of ballpark uh, performance of each other. What, do you know what they were? Was it dark net, squeeze net? What did you know? Oh, these architectures? They're just, um, they're just like a family of simple vanilla convolutional networks. Not known ones. This is just so the ones that you made up? Yeah, we, we, we kind of just made them up just because like, we wanted something extremely simple. And I, I can explain why um, sort of like you're sort of seeing this difference, uh, I guess, um, offline if you want. But there are kind of clear ways in which ImageNet is not the right um, way to design your architecture for some of these tasks. And so we were able to take advantage of that. I'm sorry, what was the sample size for your task? The, the you mean the, the, the data set size? Yeah. So it's, yeah, so it's something we varied, but um, full data set size was um, maybe 200,000 images for, uh, for both of them. Um, yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, this last point is interesting because other papers, so this paper on do better image net models transfer better, and even um, the papers that Ben Rex group has been working on, on this distribution shift and sort of seeing if um, how performance correlates across distribution shift um, does show that there's this correlation, but here, here we don't see this. Okay, so that was kind of a quick sort of um, overview of what the, the performance evaluations look like. Um, but we'd like to go beyond just the performance evaluation. We kind of really want to understand what is transfer learning doing to our architectures? Like what are we gaining from, from applying transfer learning, if anything at all? And you know, I mean, what we saw is like at a performance level, things are performing um, about the same. And so a really fundamental question is, well, random initialization and pre-trained weights don't really look anything like each other. So we have one thing sitting in one part of the space, another set of parameters sitting in another part of the space. What's happening during this fine tuning process? Is it just that it doesn't really matter how you initialize and then after you fine tune, you just sort of change dramatically and everything you initialize with is erased so we could just kind of do whatever we liked or is something else going on? And to answer that question, what we really want to do is we want to look at some of the, the latent representations of these models and, and take a measurement to see how similar they are. The problem with trying to do this kind of an analysis is that comparing representations from different neural networks is, is really difficult. There's this alignment problem. It's not like one neuron in a layer of one network is going to correspond nicely to, to another neuron in the layer of another network. Uh, in fact, there's no reason that one neuron maps to another neuron at all. It could be like a group of neurons that are having the same function as, as a single neuron in another network or one group mapping to, to another group. So it's pretty complicated. But in another line of work, we've been looking at doing exactly these kinds of comparisons uh, using canonical correlation analysis. And the basic framing is as follows. We have some data set of interest, and we're going to think of the, a neuron's representation, what it's learned, as what we call an activation vector. So we feed in this kind of data set of interest, and this neuron is going to emit a scalar value across all of these, these input points. And we can literally just sort of stack all of these, and that'll form a vector that we call the, the activation vector of this neuron. And so there's this sort of nice um, framework where we kind of think of these neurons as these activation vectors. And because layers are linearly combining their neurons, there are sort of these subspaces that are sort of spanned by their neurons. So. I'm, so, so this is going to be at a very high level. The details of like all the, the, the mathematical details of CCA are in the relevant papers. But so at, at a very high level, what we do is we take in two sets of these neuron activation vectors. And they're typically going to be layers. So a layer from one network, a layer from another network. Um, and then CCA will find the linear combination of these neurons that maximizes correlation. And by iteratively applying this uh, process, we can basically get something like a similarity score between these layers. So the score just tells us, well, you know, how, how similar are, are the representations learned by these layers, um, um, sort of up to sort of scaled linear transforms. So that's the way in which it addresses this, this alignment issue. And so previously, we've kind of used this to study various properties of convolutional networks. Um, lately, it's been um, become quite popular in studying um, various different kinds of language models in, in NLP. Um, and more broadly, this, this kind of entire area of, of studying similarity between deep representations um, has quite a lot of people who have been thinking about it. Um, so we're, we're, I'm mostly going to be um, talking about using CCA, but the first paper here was probably this paper called Convergent Learning by Lee, Yosinski, Kloon, um, Lipson, and Hopcroft in ICLR 2016, uh, where instead of dealing with the distributed problem, they just tried to find nice one-to-one -one mappings between, between neurons in different networks. Um, then we, we kind of followed up with some of the CCA work. Uh, then there was a more recent paper that's really pushing this framework of having activation net, um, vectors for neurons and, and sort of comparing similarities between subspaces. Um, and then most recently, there's been this paper, Similarity of Neural Networks um, Representations Revisited by Kornblith, Neruzzi, Lee, and Hinton um, that's broadly proposing a kernel-based similarity measure. Um, and one, one quick note about sort of all of these is that um, I think performing these sort of similarity comparisons is a very interesting way to try and get at what our neural networks are doing. Um, it's kind of useful for interpretability and it has interesting consequences for things like um, compression and for model ensembling. Um, and sort of all of these papers, including our own, are interesting, but I think there's a lot of scope for doing things in a more formal and a more principled way. <laughs>
So although many of these methods are built off of sort of principled techniques, uh, a lot of the ways in which we apply them are indeed heuristic. And we, I don't think we can claim we fully understand their limitations or, or where best to use them. So I think there are a whole bunch of interesting questions in this space. But OK, so going back to transfer learning, um, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a very simple experiment. We're going to train a bunch of networks from pre-trained weights. We're going to train a bunch of networks from random initialization. Then we're going to apply CCA to just see how similar they are to each other. We want a baseline. So CCA is going to give us these similarity scores. But we want some kind of a baseline to compare these two. And so we're also going to look at the similarity scores we get when we train a population of networks from different random initializations and, and apply CCA there. So here are what the results look like. So along the x-axis are sort of different architectures. These blue points are what you get from doing this comparison from networks trained from different random initializations. And these uh, yellow points are what you get when comparing pre-trained networks to networks trained from random initialization. So and you don't compare different, across different uh, architectures. Um, yeah, so, so you do see different architectures here. Um, but you don't compare the similarity of representation. Ah, good point. No, we, we didn't do that. And that would be kind of an interesting thing to study, um, definitely. Um, so, so, but yeah, so we just kind of stayed within an architecture. But kind of the, the takeaway is that these blue points are sort of higher up than these yellow points. What does that mean? Well, it means that models trained from random initializations seem to be more similar to each other representationally than, than models trained um, from, from pre trained weights and transfer learning. So, even though we're seeing the same performance, there is something different happening at the, the representational level. So, oh, yeah. The different circles correspond to different layers? What are the oh, the different circles actually compare, uh, correspond to different networks. So we trained multiple networks, and then we just sort of performed, uh, we performed these comparisons. Is it averaged over the layers, or what layer do you use? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's averaged over the layers. Um, multiple, I mean, I can tell you offline, but sort of um, slightly different layers for different networks because their architectures are a bit different. But yeah, taking a few layers at different stages in the network, performing this comparison, and then averaging. Uh, how come you by the scale of the numbers? So it's like I take uh, basically I have two distributions, and I get a bunch of samples from one population, one samples from the other, uh -huh. and uh, you know, like basically, it could, it could just be something. I, I guess what I'm wondering is, like the like okay, like any statistic is going to be kind of approximate somehow, like you know, but I could distinguish between the two populations. But you know, this number of like 34 and a half versus 36, is this enough to tell me something about the I representational mean, capacity for what's going to happen in the downstream path? I think, I think like the important point, I think it is hard to compare across architectures, at least the way we did this experiment, just because like we looked at different layers and things. And I mean, we'd have within an architecture, just so, like it's that difference of one point of CCA similarity actually telling us a lot about transferability. I think um, I think, well, not about transferability, but I think it is actually telling us something about what's similar versus what's not similar. Like, I think that was the whole point of like kind of having this sort of baseline comparison, I guess, in, in blue. And I think the fact that we see, and we tried like multiple networks for that. So I think the fact that we are seeing that the blue things are higher, like in most cases, is telling us that there is more similarity there. You, yeah. Another question just about the setup. You, you have different initializations, mm -hmm. but then you train on the same training data? We train on the same training data, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because um, we're interested in, um, oh, lots of questions. OK, we're interested, we're interested in, uh, yeah, sort of seeing what this looks like once we've trained on the medical data. Uh, I guess my question is, what kind of conclusion do you make from this? Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so like we're, we're not done making the conclusion yet, but sort of the first thing we saw was that like performance is similar. And so like hypothesis one is like it kind of doesn't matter how you initialize and like they're actually all doing the same thing all the way through. Um, so on top they're clearly similar because performance is similar, but like we don't know what's happening in between. So, so then we try this analysis and then, and then it looks like different things are happening in between, um, but there's kind of more coming. Uh, yep. Uh, so CCA assumes that the inputs are um, like linear. You take a linear combination. I was wondering if you uh, try like deep CCA where uh, you take a nonlinear, or why did you assume uh, make the linearity assumption? Yeah, so th I mean that's a good question. You could definitely try deep CCA for for CCA. Like I mean, we have to have some kind of I guess place where we want to say something is like 
like where we kind of conclude that things are not that similar to each other representationally. And we thought linear was like kind of a good proxy because, you know, layers kind of operate linearly. And so like, you know, if things are sort of within linear transforms of each other, it seems like a reasonable kind of call to say, okay, that's sort of somewhat similar. Um, whereas, yeah, when you come to like not, like I think the nonlinear comparison could also be interesting, but yeah, you need to know exactly when to call things similar and not similar. Oh, oh man, so many questions. Uh, okay, I'll take one more question and then maybe move on. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Whoever has okay, first. Zach, maybe we'll chat more offline. Okay, yeah. yeah. So do you see more similarity in early layers and to later layers? Yeah, so it's uh, that's an interesting question and one I'm about to get to. So, um, so the answer is like I think for like some models you see that, but not for not for not for others. And so that is about to come up. Yeah. So, 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 okay. So, like, kind of. Um, so we saw performance was similar, and then a hypothesis is maybe they're just all doing the same things. That doesn't seem to quite be the case. And now, like, kind of, let's look further into that. And um, to look further into that, let's do something really simple. So this are the actual filters from the first convolutional layer of, uh, of ResNet that's kind of initialized with pre-trained weights. So you take, take your ResNet, you pre-train it on ImageNet, and this is what the filters look like. Um, and sort of you know, true to kind of um, the community's expectations, you see all of these really nice Gabor filters come up. Just oh, a yeah. clarification. When you say they do the same thing, do you mean that outputs are the same, or they actually have the same, they join the same architecture? Because uh, they, they may have similar output with very different architecture. Right? Um, so I think. Very different weights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think the weights. So CCA only operates on like activations. Like I think it's like I think it's difficult to sometimes make um, c direct comparisons between weights because your weights can look really different. But I think functionally is like what we what's like more interesting to to us. Like I mean, there's like the standard experiment where you have like a ground truth neural network and then you train something to mimic that. But like even there, like the weights are not going to look like that similar. But like kind of outputs wise. Is, is yeah what we're looking at. Well, yeah. So we're interested, like whether there are kind of functional similarities in the, the like like the actual outputs, and so that's what we we study. Yeah, just a oh. quick comment by 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 making your your similarity measure parameterized by the examples, not by the weights. It factors out all these invariances and permutations and stuff like that inside of a network. And like she mentioned, there are lots of papers, lots of CCA that find all these relationships between the example mapping or the gram matrix that's in there. Yeah, like I think almost all of these, like even, even the paper that was doing kernel-based measures, yeah, like kind of thinking about it in terms of examples, I think is kind of really helpful for doing these sort of similarity measures. Um, but okay, so, so we're gonna do something even simpler. Let's just look at like, let's just look at the filters. Okay, so these are the filters from Conv1 that we've initialized from having pre-trained freshly off of ImageNet. Look at all of these go gorgeous Gabor filters. What happens when we, when we train this network? Um, so we train it on this medical data, and well, after training, it actually looks kind of similar. So, so maybe that just means that you know these like these kind of Gabor filters are perfect for this medical data. Okay, now let's see what happens when we do the same thing from random initialization. So this is what our our network looks like when we randomly initialize it, and again, we're going to train it on this medical data. So we do that, and oh man, this actually also looks somewhat similar. So, so, so what is going on? Because so over here, like maybe you could say, oh, there's interesting feature reuse happening, but but you're also seeing the same stuff for random initialization. Okay, so that's like our that's that's ResNet. Now we we've trained a whole bunch of other architectures, and some of them are much smaller. So what happens here? Well, here's one of our very small architectures. It's maybe one tenth the size of of the ResNet. So here it is, um, initialized with its uh, nice image net weights. And what happens after training? Well, it actually changes dramatically. Um, and then again, if we look at it at random initialization and then look at it after training, again, it changes significantly. But your architecture has no skip connections. The architecture doesn't so have skip connections. I mean, these activations, maybe we should interpret them by adding, you know, adding across layers or something. Like the, the real representation is going to depend on all the layers, not. So this is just, yeah, so, so because the architectures are different, we looked at conv1 specifically for that because it's sort of below all of that. And now you are getting feedback from kind of the skip connections that you aren't getting. But I think this, this is also true for, for, say, like something like Inception as well. I'm just sort of showing, um, showing ResNet here. And I think, I think what's really going on is to do with sort of to do with the size of these models. Um, so yeah, so two quick points. One point that's kind of interesting is that everyone loves Gabor filters, but these models are not actually, the smaller model, which is changing a lot, doesn't actually really seem to be learning at least the classical Gabor filters. And so here are like places where there's a Gabor filter and it's actually erased the Gabor filter. 
So like here's another place where it's kind of Gabor filter erased, Gabor filter erased. And then the other point is related to what Matusa already brought up, which is that um, like what we observe through kind of further experiments is that the size, I think the size of these architectures is actually um, kind of uh, really impacting what you see during this fine tuning process. So like the kind of picture we have in our head is sort of maybe, so random initialization and pre-trained weights take us to um, sort of very um, different parts of the space. Um, but sort of somehow uh, when your model is kind of large and these image net architectures are indeed in some sense seem to be large for these medical tasks, maybe you just don't sort of move as much. And then, um, and then whereas when you have sort of smaller models, you sort of change a lot more. Now we've, you know, we've throughout this workshop we've seen lots and lots of interesting um, work on on the neural tangent kernel and sort of thinking about these infinite um, with limits and the kernel regime um, um, versus the sort of the not the the deep regime, um, but like at least to, to, to my kind of uh, high level understanding, it's not a direct mapping to what we're seeing here. So I think it's kind of interesting to, to sort of study this further and try and understand, try and make this connection because there's probably some kind of a connection and sort of understanding why this is happening uh, would be really interesting. Okay, so um, final point is that in the paper we have a lot more kind of work on sort of broadly thinking about similarity and reuse. Um, there are other interesting things we see, like we can, so for our larger models, our similarity at initialization can be pretty really predictive sort of of similarity post training. Um, we can also um, like kind of look at how much feature reuse is happening and this interesting co adaptation problem, um, which happy to chat about more offline. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, time is running out, and I don't want. To, I want to make sure we get to lunch on time. So um, I wanted to end with um, I think one of the most interesting observations we saw during this entire set of experiments. Um, so one thing we observe again and again across different architectures and, and across our different setups is that. When you train with pre-trained weights versus training from random initialization, there is a huge difference in convergence speed. So this uh, yellow line here is what you get when you convert um, in a sort of your training your training curve uh, with with pre-trained weights, and this blue line is what you see with random initialization. If you sort of extend these far enough out, they basically converge to the same value, but there's this sort of huge difference in in how quickly they converge. And you know when you when you first see this plot, you might think, oh, well, this means that transfer learning is doing its job. Like you know, you've learned some useful features, and you're sort of reusing it, and that's why you're converging faster. But we've also seen a lot of counterintuitive results on the things that larger models are sort of maybe a bit lazier and just don't move as much. Um, and it's it's still kind of not fully clear exactly how much feature reuse is happening in this in this process. And so we tried an experiment to try and understand why we see this difference in convergence speeds. And the experiment is very simple. So we decided to initialize by drawing weights IID uh, from, from sort of the same distribution as random initialization, but rescaled to match the pre-trained weights. So sort of here's, here's what this concretely would look like. If you initialize with pre-trained weights, uh, you'd look something like this. If you initialize with random initialization, you've of course destroyed all the features and it looks something like this. And then this thing, which we call the mean var in it, I mean, it looks exactly like random initialization, except that its scaling is different because you've, you've sort of rescaled. So how does this do if we initialize with this and train instead? Turns out that it actually helps a lot with convergence speed. And we sort of see this across different architectures and across our different tasks. And so what's really interesting here. Sorry, are you taking the mean and variance from the image net transfer? From the pre-trained weights, exactly. And, and, and it's per layer, so not across the entire architecture. That wouldn't make sense. But sort of per layer, take this and then initialize. Um, and so what's really interesting is that, yeah, um, this, is, this is a feature independent property. Because we're sampling IID, we've kind of destroyed all of the features. And we're only kind of keeping the scaling. But and all these examples are on a roughly 200,000 example downstream path. Yeah, these are, these are just both for the, the, the two large scale medical imaging tasks this we looked at. A, I think it's a really important part of this, at least from what we've seen at like NLD, and, and from what we already know from images, uh -huh. even not natural images, is that it seems that both the absolute size of the available data on the downstream path and the relative order of magnitude of the amount of data on the source first target task has a a dramatic impact here. Like, in, if you look at like BERT, GPT-2, all this stuff, we were doing the exact same things in 2014, but instead of training on the billion word data set, we were training on um, uh, like Pentry Bank or something like this. And that difference of like the discrepancy, like, and I've seen, I, I know at least internally at Amazon, I had some colleagues who were doing some stuff that was like, 
how many how many unsupervised examples would I like? What, if I if I were choosing, if I had a cost of like how much would I pay to get a million unsupervised uh, examples versus a uh, hundred extra labeled ones or something like that? And these numbers can be you know it could be it could be a very big difference. So I wonder with one million versus two hundred thousand, if you're sort of on the same order of magnitude, and that's why you see. Yeah, so, so actually this specific experiment, we also, so like, I'm, I'm not covering this here, but we tried a bunch of things where we varied the data, and so it's interesting, but this is actually pretty robust to varying the data, so you see the same sort of like um, convergence, uh, like you actually see a speed up even when your data is much smaller. Um, one thing you do see is that with these really large ImageNet architectures, if you have something as small as like 5,000 data points, that's when you see like a little bit more of a gap between transfer learning versus random initialization, maybe it's like 2%, but then by the time you've gotten to 50,000 examples, that gap is like almost gone and and like there's really no reason why you'd a priori want to use a like kind of image net size architecture on like 5,000 examples like I think that's sort of like also like kind of yeah merits sort of further study we've been talking about over parametrization I think that's like an interesting related question um, but yeah the main point here is that this is like this is just purely a feature like a property of scaling and it's kind of a purely feature independent property um, and so I think there are a whole bunch of open questions here, especially related to this kind of scaling part. So specifically, is there sort of maybe some scaling rule that explains this convergence speed up? We looked at this a little bit, but sort of not extensively, and there are differences. But I think um, it seems like it should be possible to maybe pin this down. Um, and then I think um, we also did some very preliminary experiments on natural images. And I think we're seeing sort of similar effects. And there are kind of interesting questions we can ask here. Like, you know, if we train and then sort of reinitialize, but just preserve the scale, like, you know, you see a difference in convergence speed. That's like one of the, the basic questions we could try and try and answer. Um, and then I think there are sort of other questions that also came up through this process, sort of like kind of um, maybe really kind of getting at sort of similarity of representations at initialization versus after training, and sort of how do things vary between large and small models? Because at least, I mean, looking at the weights, certainly they're learning very different filters. So sort of understanding that better um, would be really interesting. And then I think there's also kind of scope here to, to actually formalize things a little more. So I'm, I'm sort of seeing medical imaging partially also as this way of um, seeing a place where transfer learning does provide some benefits, some convergence benefits, but in a scheme where like the, the source and target distribution are extremely different from each other. And so just understanding better what might be happening there and maybe saying something formal there could also be very interesting. Um, yeah, and with that, thanks for, thanks for coming. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like honestly, if you look at how much, how long you train rent from random initialization versus training on ImageNet plus training on the medical data, like training from random initialization is going to be way faster. Like this, but this question makes sense. Like, sort of, th the reason this question is very important is because people are just downloading their models from GitHub and then sort of just doing the fine tuning. So at that point, you're like, oh well, you know, this thing is readily available. So do I want to do this or do I want to do do something else? Um, yeah. Oh, yep. Uh, one small question. So you, you you evaluate the CCA similarity over uh, you mentioned two hundred thousand images. No, we didn't do 200,000, so I can chat with you offline about that. But you, you don't need to do 200,000 to, to kind of get a good similarity measure. You can do something smaller than that. Um, the trade-off there is between sort of like the number of data points you're using and sort of the actual number of like kind of vectors you're trying to find similarities over. So previous, slide So you you're actually proving the point that this if you if you grab these things off of your help and you have limited resources, you can quickly arrive at the desired if you don't have infinite resources, that's the way to go. Yeah, I mean, this this is why people. So so okay. So I think there are two parts to this. Firstly, like people, I think there's some amount of people like using transfer learning simply because they've seen other people do it, and like you, kind of you train it, and then you can do this process, and it sort of works, and you're like, oh great. Um, but I think um, I think in sort of settings where people are doing extensive experimentation, like I know within Google, like part of the reason transfer learning is popular is I mean they have resources, but you're still trying to run a lot of experiments, and part of the reason transfer learning is popular is because of this 
this speed up you see in convergence. Um, I think like you have to be a little careful about this because um, part of the reason I think you also see this speed up in convergence is because you're, you're also committed to this image net architecture. So like in the paper, um, we sort of study this further, but you know, I think like where meaningful feature reuse is happening, if it is happening, is really in the lower layers. And so um, one way to get sort of similar speed ups, but maybe have a better architecture is like you kind of just reuse some of the weights and then you sort of reinitialize stuff and sort of train that away. Um, and this ties into like kind of all kinds of other interesting questions. So like there's been this interesting point in, in deep learning about this co-adaptation problem, which is suppose I have an initialization, but I only keep part of it and then I kind of reset everything else. How will those work together? Um, and, it, and it's kind of interesting because um, for some settings that's been a problem. For this, it doesn't appear to be a problem. Um, so that's also another interesting question to study, I think. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you see a difference if you train, uh, so say you take a pre-trained model versus the one trained on, on your data? Uh -huh. uh, suppose you vary the size of your data, for example, like thousands and thousands and thousands. Does it make any difference? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I guess. Uh, I guess Zach and I were, were like, I guess this was a discussion we mentioned briefly earlier. So if you have a very, very small am amount of data, you will see a bit of a difference. So I think we had to get to 5,000 data points on the ImageNet architectures at least. Um, and so there we saw maybe like a 2% difference instead of like a fraction of a percent difference. Um, but then by the time we got up to like 50,000 data points, that kind of, that difference was really gone. And then when we tried on a much smaller architecture, so bear in mind before we were training this enormous ImageNet architecture. So we tried on a much smaller architecture and then there, it didn't really seem like there was much of a difference. So I think, I think yes, you do see a difference, but part of this is like a because you've committed to an architectural choice. So let's take oh. the speaker again, and then we'll come back. To the